amazing conversation. Thank you so much, Derek, for leading this, Beth, Franny, Gibson, and Jay, and then Ken. And, and Ken, I really wanted to thank you for your trust and continued engagement with the GFCC. As Deborah had said before, we are proud to have the Africa Development Futures Group as a GFCC member. We look forward to continuing to work together. I think that the, the bottom line message from the session that was just finished now is that we need trained people on the ground. And this connects very well with the conversation that we're having in two minutes from now. So we need that in Africa. We need that across the globe. So the importance of developing skills and, and training people and having the facilities to do that is essential. So please be tuned for the conversation that we will have now. So now we are really starting this leadership conversation, future innovation hubs. We are delighted to have here three of the GFCC university members, like Webster University that let's say Beth Trouble was uh, uh, representing in a few minutes ago. We are starting this session now, Future Innovation Hubs, I would say talking about the nexus connecting four things, people, knowledge, future, and the world. Really how we, the importance of local regional economies and local regional innovation ecosystems. How we can increase and expand the knowledge base of those economies and the fundamental roles that the universities and research organizations play in that, how that is relevant and needed to build a future economy, to transition economies, to build new industries or new sectors in the economy, and finally, to connect regions and cities globally and make them global innovation hotspots. To talk about these matters, we had three amazing guests today, and I will briefly introduce them to you. We're happy and delighted to have our colleague and friend, Professor Harris Pastidis. Harris is the interim president of the University of South Carolina. He has been serving um, uh, there, he served there as the president, he's the president emeritus, and he's overseeing this whole process of transition there to search for a new president. Harris has been a fundamental leader in the GFCC Universal Research Leadership Forum. Together with his colleague from Qatar, President Hassan Alderhan, who is the president of Qatar University. I think Harris and Hassan joined us for different, in different occasions for the GFCC Universal Research Leadership Forum. And from Okinawa, Japan, we have Professor Mary Collins. Mary is the provost of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, a graduate university and a very innovative one, a university that on the one hand doesn't have any departments and works basically around projects and research programs and that was created in connection with the local reality of Okinawa and ensure Mary will talk about that. We have a short vignette and then I'll transition to Harry's. Welcome, Professor Pastidis. It's great to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Roberto and uh, esteemed colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, but not good night because, uh, because we have an exciting uh, session today. I'm honored to have two outstanding colleagues. We will be uh, emphasizing uh, university and higher education's role in establishing and maintaining uh, innovation hubs. Uh, I'll you know, reintroduce them in a moment after I make a few opening comments. Then each of our speakers will make some introductory comments as well. 
And then we will have what probably will be the uh, highlight of this session, which will be a, a Q&A session that we will uh, encourage others to participate in. Uh, let me start the conversation by emphasizing the critical importance, though, of innovation, but not only the word innovation, uh, not only universities who say they are innovative or who uh, partner with outside groups, but who really work within their core uh, to demonstrate their creativity, their curiosity, uh, their technology, uh, and ultimately their innovation. Uh, in my opinion, innovation is not only about technology. It does not come from technology alone. Uh, it comes from combining technology with all of the or many of the disciplines within a university, including cultural, uh, artistic, uh, humanitarian, and policy activities. And we have all of them, and too often we relegate innovation to the engineers or perhaps to the basic scientists. So my first point to make is that universities offer a rich talent base, and too often we leave those not in the engineering or uh, science disciplines out of innovation. We know that the most innovative people throughout history, I'll give a few Western examples, I know there are many more from the East, uh, would include Leonardo da Vinci and Albert Einstein and many others. And uh, the characteristics of those individuals is that they cultivated their aesthetic as well as their scientific uh, minds and parts of their brains. And we have the entire brain will within a university. Let's not leave people outside of the engineering and basic science disciplines uh, behind. The other thing we need to do is organize ourselves from within. If we are to be better partners and better uh, accelerators of innovation hubs, we need to do a better job of not having uh, the relevant components of what we do in silos. So for example, we at the University of South Carolina uh, created what we call an Office of Economic Engagement. Uh, and we took the technology transfer uh, operations of the university and put them in the same umbrella with uh, the individuals who work with uh, corporate partnership uh, and other entrepreneurship activities. We also engaged our students, again, often overlooked as we talk about the uh, rich uh, opportunities within a university, and perhaps nobody would be surprised to know that within our technology incubator, most of the companies that uh, we support are student-led and student-run companies, all often related to software uh, development, but the uh, technology incubator is buzzing with activities, mainly from graduate, but even with undergraduate students. So we have to emphasize the totality of who we are. Number two, we have to remain focused. Too, too many times universities claim that they can participate uh, in every innovation hub that you could come up with. And uh, here at our university, we've identified some clusters uh, that include uh, artificial intelligence and uh, health sciences. Uh, advanced manufacturing to name those that we really focus on. And when we can develop a critical mass, I think partners will come to us in that domain. So it's important for the most part, there are some universities that maybe can engage in every innovation in every sector, but by and large, most of us need to remain uh, focused. And finally, let me say that uh, a an important key to all of this is communication, uh, communication and communication, uh, where, uh, where, we, where we share information in an open and reasonably transparent platform until we get to the point where technology, of course, uh, must remain private for competitive reasons, but too often uh, what we do remains a secret. And we need to engage with the broader uh, community and partners to let them know who we are, what we do, and how we might help. A holistic approach to the development of innovation hubs. So with that, let me introduce uh, uh, our two speakers again, Dr. Mary Collins, Provost of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, or OIST. OIST is a graduate university uh, with an innovative model. The university has no departments, and that would be very 
uh, provocative at my university. So good for you, Dr. Collins. It was accredited and inaugurated in 2011. Therefore, it's a modern uh, university. Professor Collins studied biochemistry at Cambridge and then attended the University of London at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, where she received her PhD, and also has served as head of the new Division of Advanced Therapies at the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control. So Mary, may we invite you to make a few opening remarks? Well, thank you very much, Harris. And um, for those of you who don't know where Okinawa is, it's an island um, about uh, two hours flight south of Tokyo. And it's closer to Taiwan really than to Tokyo. So uh, an interesting thing is actually we're rather a good regional uh, center being close to South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, uh, not so far from Singapore. Um, and I think uh, this island used to be an independent kingdom, the kingdom of the Ryukus. And they've always traded with everybody around this region and been a good friend to, to, to all. So I think actually the location of Okinawa is um, rather uh, advantageous for partnering different um, uh, universities around um, this part of the South China Sea. Um, I think that the island also brings extra um, avenues of innovation. Uh, and one project we're, we're pushing hard at the moment is to work on healthy aging. We're one of those uh, places which has an, un, an extraordinary number of centenarians and um, the uh, genetics and lifestyle of Okinawans is of great interest, I think, these days. Um, the other thing we're interested in, um, in terms of um, uh, commercialization, is methods for um, ecological monitoring. Uh, we have a pretty much intact coral fringing reef around the island. We have a beautiful subtropical rainforest. And these are things which mean that if we work on our, our natural environment here, um, these are things that people are pretty interested in now in commercializing methods to um, preserve nature and to monitor um, the effect of, 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 of uh, habitation on nature. So I think our location brings us some rather special projects. Um, Okinawa was traditionally the um, poorest um, uh, province of Japan, had a low um, health outcomes, low education outcomes. And part of the rationale for putting OIST in Okinawa was to improve the economy. Um, and I would say we've done that um, pretty much straight off because we're a great employer in Okinawa and we have many Okinawans coming back to work at OIST. They've been rather a di diaspora over the years and they, they like this idea of working in a high tech university. Um, and we're also trying to bring in companies um, from outside to work at OIST in our incubator, not just um, fostering OIST's own inventions. So um, we're small, we have about, we're growing to about 100 faculty members. So that's going to be maybe 1500 people in total, students, postdocs, faculty. Um, but I think it, it is a model of what you should do in a particular location and what you can do for a local population as well as an international and national population. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Mary. And of course, we'll come back to you in a few moments. Um, President Hassan al Haram from Qatar University in Doha, welcome. Uh, Qatar University is the leading university uh, of uh, Qatar, founded in 1977. Uh, and uh, the president and the administration are emphasizing university transformation and innovation strategies in line with the uh, nation's uh, development strategy. Uh, Dr. Alderam has been president since 2015 and plays a major role in all of these activities. He holds his doctoral degree and postgraduate diploma in construction project management from what is now the University of South Wales, 
as well as a master's degree in civil engineering from Georgia Tech and an undergraduate degree at NC a &T University. Under his leadership, numerous uh, technical research centers were initiated and he led the inauguration of the university's research complex. Welcome, Mr. President. Thank you, Harris. Thank you very much uh, for the GFCC for giving me this opportunity to um, share with you uh, what we are doing and to learn also from uh, our colleagues and uh, uh, sister universities. Uh, as you know, Qatar is a small state in the Persian Gulf. It's uh, uh, gained, it gained its independence in 1972. As you mentioned, Qatar University is the leading uh, national university, which was established in 1977. And currently we have uh, 10 different colleges uh, providing uh, more than 100 uh, plus uh, different programs between uh, graduate and undergraduate degrees. Uh, our current student population is about 25,000 students. So uh, basically Qatar University is uh, considered as a major hub within the city of Doha, uh, where, uh, I, by the way, Qatar will host the uh, FIFA World Cup football uh, next year. So um, uh, as you know, there is uh, you know, so many activities, uh, infrastructure projects going on, but Qatar itself uh, is uh, considered as an oil rich country or uh, also a natural uh, gas, uh, you know, uh, the hydrocarbon, uh, uh, our economy is based on hydrocarbon. And our current, uh, you know, uh, national vision, the Qatar national vision 2030 aims to uh, move uh, towards uh, innovation and uh, uh, knowledge-based uh, economy. And uh, uh, Qatar has been implementing a wide uh, variety of innovation and economic mm -hmm. diversification programs and initiatives in order to support such transition, where also the university uh, you know, uh, plays a major role in, in such a thing. So uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, we are now in um, implementation of our uh, strategy uh, which we call it, you know, a transformation strategy that will probably, you know, we hope to um, uh, to provide like uh, to make to make like a leap a frog, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, development of our uh, whether it is program uh, our programs our uh, the way that we you know teach uh, 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 the student experience. Uh, uh, also, uh, entrepreneurship and uh, and as well as innovation is in the heart of our strategy. So, uh, for this reason, uh, we have also uh, created, uh, you know, or made some uh, initiatives. Maybe during the discussion, we we can highlight some of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me, uh, first of all, let, let me invite our audience to begin submitting questions that they may have using the chat function. Let me start with a question about faculty participation. We, when we talk about university participation, it is not us, the administrators, not generally the students, generally the faculty who contribute. When I was a younger faculty member, I was disincentivized from working with the private sector. Uh, one particular way is that at the end of the year in my annual review, I was given no credit, no reward, no recognition for working as, let's say, a consultant with a, uh, with a private sector in my region to help them develop. So my question is, do we encourage, do we incentivize our professors enough do we, uh, in order to let it be known that that working with the private sector in the development or maintenance of an innovation hub in our region is actually welcomed by the university rather than not, imp not as important as teaching or other kinds of scholarship. Mary, could you start with that? Yes, I think um, it obviously depends a, a bit on the discipline of the professor, but um, out of our 80 or so established professors at OIST, about 30 have um, engaged with our tech transfer section. 
and patented things, which I think is quite good for a young university. And some of them are young professors as well, maybe doing their first bit of sort of thinking about commercialization. And we've had three of our faculty spin out companies. So I, I think we do give credit at the end of the year. Um, we have a very good high trust funding system of core funding from the government. And um, part of that comes up, so people come up for review every five years on this. And the patents and industrial income is, is welcomed in that review. So I, I think we've, we're trying, yeah. Very good. And Hassan, how about you with also reference to the business school uh, faculty uh, along with the engineers and others. Do you think your faculty are recognized and rewarded by your university for this kind of involvement? See, we are trying to, you know, to build the ecosystem here. You know, uh, uh, the Middle East region and where Qatar also, you know, uh, um, you know, is part of it, you know, uh, we are trying to have a paradigm shift into our culture, you know, uh, uh, you know, in the past, uh, universities here were very traditional approach. They, you know, usually uh, the the mission for for any university is to provide the society, the local society, with you know, uh, competent you know graduates to join the workforce. You know, uh, and this is where when we you know uh, started to uh, to build our strategy to move from such you know. Uh, uh, dilemma or trap, I would say, into uh, a new modern uh, university that would, you know, really uh, be part of the uh, society, be more engaged with the society, with the community, as well as to be a catalyst uh, for uh, social and economic development. And uh, when we say also economic development, uh, we don't only, you know, may, uh, you know, uh, look at only monetizing, you know, our activities as uh, faculties or, you know, uh, uh, professors, but also, you know, uh, being part of the society from social perspective is also important for us. So, for uh, you know, we, we try to build, you know, this ecosystem hand on hand with the government. So there is like a top down approach that comes from the government for major initiatives that, you know, uh, uh, that is part of the national strategy of the, of the country. But also there is a bottom up approach that the university is trying to do. So for, for, for this reason, uh, we came up with several, you know, uh, and significant structural uh, and legal governors and operational models to support our vision uh, in making the university as an engine and a catalyst for innovation and uh, sustainable uh, you know, socioeconomic impact for Qatar. Uh, for example, uh, we had initiated a holding company for the university as a commercial arm where our faculty, researchers, uh, uh, students could you know, uh, uh, convert their ideas uh, into commercialization uh, and uh, we we try to support them through you know moving from uh, you know technology uh, readiness level three into you know uh, level four seven or or eight so that they can embark into the uh, into the uh, you know uh, the the business world. Uh, we we have also uh, we've been working lately on an endowment fund for the university as an investment arm, where also could, this investment arm could re-inject some of the initiatives into our uh, you know, uh, colleges uh, and uh, academic uh, programs and uh, uh, research centers. Um, uh, our, uh, uh, our strategies uh, you know, also you know, uh, are, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, it's not only one strategy in, in a kind, but in a such, but uh, uh, we have uh, our transformation strategy is, is consisted of seven different strategies. Two of them, we call them enabling strategies, uh, which, uh, which are uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And the other one is uh, smart campus and digitization. And for this, we have initiated a new division uh, for strategic innovation and economic development uh, office, 
which is directly under the president, uh, you know, uh, uh, supervision to drive innovation and economic development programs, initiatives uh, across the university uh, and the holding company and, and to, to build the, this comprehensive ecosystem that you mentioned in your introduction, uh, you know, Harris. Well, thank you. Let me, uh, thank you. Let me shift to uh, the more traditional um, area where universities are expected to deliver, and that would be workforce. But let me also posit that uh, we tend to be traditional. We say, well, we educate students and this is your workforce. But I'll give you two examples from our university where uh, in the past, this has not been good enough. Uh, first of all, all three of, our, uh, all three of us on this panel uh, are, in, are from areas where we have uh, uh, the sea, the ocean uh, nearby. And as we know, uh, today, there's a great global shortage of goods, uh, not often due to uh, their, the manufacturing problem, but really more to the supply chain and to logistics. So we uh, have created, and, and as an example, we have Boeing uh, that ships uh, most of the Dreamliners, the 787. I saw one painted in the Cutter Airways uh, co uh, colors recently, ready to take off. Uh, BMW, every X series BMW in the world is uh, assembled uh, in South Carolina and shipped from the port, also Volvo and Michelin and others. Uh, and so we created uh, both at the undergraduate level and at the master's level, uh, a global supply chain and logistics degree program. These students are scooped up well before they graduate. It is uh, remarkable to see how well they do. Secondly, we created an engineering management degree. Uh, our companies were telling us we don't only need engineers, we need engineers who can work with spreadsheets, uh, be team leaders, can communicate, can write and speak effectively. So combining engineering with other, what I'd call managerial uh, activities. So let me ask the two of you, whether your universities have embarked on any uh, new degrees or any other ways where you can sharpen the workforce uh, for the innovation hubs in your areas. Mary, let me start with you. So at the moment, we only have PhD students and um, they are in general, uh, with some of them are undertaking innovation classes as you, as you were describing, but in general, they're, they're, they're following a fairly basic academic route, but we're about to start a certificate program um, in cybersecurity and quantum computing. Uh, Japan has a big deficit in cybersecurity experts. And we see that as a sort of lifelong learning certificate program that we're going to start. Thank you. And Hassan? Yes, I think, you know, we are all uh, facing similar, you know, challenges. And uh, uh, similarly, we are introducing a master program in cybersecurity. Uh, in collaboration with the University of Britain Sud in France uh, as a dual degree. Uh, there are several uh, programs uh, interdisciplinary between, you know, whether it is in engineering and, for example, College of Business and Economics or College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, so we encourage such programs, especially for major minor programs. So uh, these programs and others, you know, uh, especially as you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, for innovation, where a human aspect is an important element uh, for, uh, for our students and our graduates. So we want to make sure that our graduate attributes are comprehensive and uh, uh, through, through either the core curriculum uh, programs that we have or through the major minor or, you know, uh, double majors and uh, three plus one or other, you know, schemes that we have introduced lately. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a question from Simone asking the panelists, what are our main uh, business verticals uh, if people wanted to collaborate or engage with uh, Okinawa, Okinawa, Qatar, uh, or South Carolina? I'll, I'll go first. Ours currently are uh, cybersecurity, uh, aerospace, uh, and health sciences or biomedical technology. Mary, how about if people wanted to engage with Okinawa, what would you say? Um, I think environmental science, 
We have a fair amount of materials science, basic study of materials like semiconductors, um, and we have some chemistry of polymers and new surfaces. Thank you. And Hassan? I think for us, maybe, you know, like a marine environment, where we do have a, you know, a very strong team and good critical mass and a research vessel and this such a thing. Uh, also wireless telecommunication, uh, where we have been, you know, also introducing several technologies that support the, you know, the intelligent tra traffic system here in Qatar. And as well as uh, uh, some engineering aspects related to uh, solar energy or uh, related to material sciences, the, the relationship between material, material science and uh, manufacturing uh, uh, are, you know, some area. I think these are some of the areas that I think of, uh, plus, of course, uh, computer uh, science and uh, security. Very good. Uh, Roberto, I don't know. I see our clock uh, running, running out. Um, are we to continue or should we thank uh, our wonderful panel? Well, uh, if we're not cut off, maybe I will uh, make one more uh, remark and we could all contribute. Um, and that is that uh, we must find ways to work with each other and to work with other universities. Sometimes uh, maybe this is an American phenomenon. I doubt it. We tend to uh, be very competitive uh, with the universities in our region. And I get it, uh, you know, on an athletic basis or on some other basis, yes, for rankings. But when it comes to innovation hubs in our regions, that is counterproductive because sometimes our universities don't have all of the expertise that would be required. And it's important for the leaders, the provosts, the presidents to show that we are collaborative with our traditional uh, competitors. These are not adversaries, of course, but they are competitors. And we need to show that, uh, that faculty uh, from, uh, in my case, the land-grant university <clears throat> and uh, us, the um, flagship university, as we call it, must work together. And uh, if they see the presidents and others, the provosts working together, they will believe that that is truly to be encouraged. I don't know if you have this uh, phenomenon, Hassan, in Qatar. Yes, I, I totally agree. And by the way, you know, the, the, the current pandemic that we live in is is an example of how we, we need to work together to complement each other uh, and to uh, you know, serve our society in a, in a much you know, uh, you know, uh, comprehensive approach, as well as uh, you know, to be more resilient uh, you know, as universities with these you know, uh, disruptive technologies, with the you know, advancement in, in, in sciences where we need to provide the society with the, you know, uh, the right graduate attributes uh, to to be you know uh, an added value uh, with 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 our you know future for our, for the future of our you know uh, generations. Wonderful. I, I made a mistake before the question. The wonderful question was from uh, Juliet Gehrig, not from Simone. Simone, of course, working with GFCC. I apologize to Juliet, but um, I do believe we're out of time. This was a concise. Uh, approach, but let me say uh, thank you to the GFCC. Uh, these conversations need to carry on uh, uh, for, uh, for the betterment of our own uh, economies and also for a, I would argue, a more peaceful and, uh, and uh, collaborative world. This is a very, very important. So thank you to uh, everybody at the GFCC. I hope there can be some follow-up. I would volunteer and I hope uh, our pan other panelists would also volunteer to keep this conversation going, and we look forward to seeing everybody at the next GFCC event. So uh, thank you, uh, Mary, and thank you, Hassan. Uh, thank you, everybody. And as I started, I will wish uh, uh, everybody a good, mo a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, and to Mary, I think I must say a good night as well. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye.